my own. I'd like for you to take part in something this morning, the beginning of my sermon. I'd like for everyone to stand, if you would, please. I'd like to t- for you to take your hand. I'd like for you to place it over your heart. I'd like for you to look up and repeat after me. God, God. I'm, impossible. I'm impossible. Okay, you may be seated. The scripture that we're going to be sharing with you from uh, is a scripture that must really be important. And the reason I say that is because, as far as I know, it's the only passage of of scripture that is in all four gospels. The same story is in all four gospels. So it must be important. We're going to turn to John, the sixth chapter, starting with verse seven. We're going to read verses five. I'm starting with verse five through seven. It says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, What can we buy? Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. He already knew what Philip's response was going to do, what what it was going to be, but still yet he asked him. It's interesting. Maybe he wanted Philip to recognize himself, what, what he was thinking inside. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, as a matter of fact, it was probably, according to Scripture, it was probably a six month period of work. Is how long it was. We wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Okay, what we see taking place here, I want you to get a picture of it. We see uh, Jesus and Philip in an interesting conversation. And Jesus is asking Philip to do something, something that is seemingly what? Impossible. Impossible. Now, you need to take into consideration that, that uh, Philip was probably very young. He prob- may have even been a teenager. And so maybe what he's thinking, he's, he, he's thinking like that teenager. Some of you parents probably know you have a kid and you, you come in and, and you ask them, you say, well, if you would, I want you to, to go clean your room. And, and that child will say, there's no way that I could do that if I did it all week. Right, Drew? Because of how big a mess it was. It was something impossible. I'm sure that he thought it was impossible. Why was it impossible? Because it tells us in his word that there were 5,000 5, men there that needed to be fed. Now, if there were 5,000 men, surely there were probably some wives there. There were probably some children there. And it's been estimated through commentaries that the different ones between 15 to 20,000 people were there. Now, does it get you in a little better perspective of what was going on here? Jesus had asked Philip about feeding these uh, people, feeding these uh, 5,000 plus people. And and here, uh, Philip, he realized it it registered to him, this, this is impossible. There's no way that we can do this. We couldn't buy enough food if we can take our put all of our money together. We couldn't buy enough food to feed all these people. And really what he was doing, like the scripture said, he said he was testing to see how he would respond to the situation. So we can see Philip's response was what? Probably frustration. It was he was exasperated. He was just overwhelmed with what Jesus had said to him. And the reason is he was frustrated was because he was in a place where he was looking at the situation from his, the natural viewpoint. His nat- what, what his eye saw, what in the natural was going to take place. We don't have food to feed these people. There's no way we can, it's impossible to be able to do this. And he was probably thinking about what the response and the reaction 
of these people were going to be because, I mean, they didn't have food. Have you ever gone in a restaurant and somebody tell you we're out of this? I go into, we've gone into a restaurant, there's a specific thing that Suzanne likes, and on the day, she gets off a little late sometimes, and we get there, we'll go in and we'll say, we want this special. And a lot of times they'll say, what? We're out. And you can see this look on Suzanne's face that I think probably all the people there, if they would have approached them and told them really where they were, well, it would have been more than a look. You know, we're the same way. Uh, we too will feel frustration, uh, feel exasperated, feel like we're in a hopeless place when we choose to view life seemingly impossible things, situations, circumstances, challenges through our natural eye, through human eyes. And that's where I want to do. I want to pause right there, and I want to give you my first uh, uh, principle that I want to share with you, and it's this. We need to look beyond, we need to look beyond, beyond the natural the natural. You know, I don't know if you know it, but it's true that in every situation in life, you're going to choose where you're going or what you're doing or how you respond. And, and your reaction to that, your perception of the situation will determine what? What you do, where you go, and even sometimes even if you overcome the impossible. We do that instead of looking at what? Instead of looking at, the title of our sermon, the God of the impossible. We always look at the way things are through our natural eyes. Uh, Philip, he was looking through his natural eyes. He wasn't realizing this is Jesus. I wonder how many things that, that they had seen that Jesus had done. I wonder how many miracles they had already seen him perform. And here he is, and he's asking them to do something. And, and they ought to realize that Jesus, when he asks something, he always has the answer. He wouldn't ask us to do something if he didn't have the answer. So, but we should be just the opposite. We don't look at who's there with us. We don't. While I was in college, I uh, worked at Kroger, and there was a young man, as Soup was praying, uh, I had a vision of this young man. There's a young man that looked very similar to Soup. He was probably a little taller. He, he, he probably weighed about 235. He had dreadlocks. Uh, and me and him became real close. We would get on the truck, and we would actually unload a whole semi-truck of groceries, pull them off onto a rail, cut them in half, break them open, slide them down the rail for someone else. And we'd take turns. We'd, we'd alternate pulling off and pushing down. And we would unload that hole. And in the process of working with him, we became close. Uh, he was also a surfer. He would go out on the beach, and, and when he wasn't working, that's what he did. He would surf. And when he would go to get on the truck, he would usually take his shirt off. He would pull his shirt off. And when he pulled his shirt off, he was, would look like what you would say, ripped. Is that the right word? I mean, you could just see every muscle in his belly. You could see his pecs, and you could see how strong he was. And he just, you could say, man, he didn't have an ounce of fat on him. And so uh, everybody just sort of respected. I can't remember his name, but everybody respected him. Well, one day he came to me after work, and he says, well, you know, tomorrow, which was a Saturday, I'm off work, you're off work, we've got our job done, we've stocked the store. Uh, is there anything you have to do? I said, I don't think so. He says, well, a bunch of us guys are going to get together and we're going to play sandlot football. I said, wow, cool, this is good. I love to play. I used to go out in the streets and I played tackle in the street before and stuff and get all cut up and thought I was tough, you know, and uh, go home and I'd get in trouble for bleeding all over everything. But uh, a bunch of us guys would get together. But that's what was taking place here. And uh, he says, I'll come by the store. I'll meet you there, and we'll go. So we got, and he had a Mark 1 Mustang. And I pulled in, jumped in his car, and we headed over. And I got there and sort of felt out of place because everybody was taller than I was. Everybody was, they had one guy who looked like Fat Albert. I mean, he just, 
big old guy come along, and then he's the guy that would line up on the line, several big guys. We chose up sides. And uh, there was one guy there, as a matter of fact, he was about 6'2", 135 pounds, I mean 235 pounds, about that. And he was a quarterback in a, high, in a college in uh, Stephen F. Austin. And I don't know if you know where that's, it's in Texas. And I think it's a bigger college now than it was at the time. What? Nacogdoches, okay. And he was there. And he was playing, and we were playing, and, and of course we were going after and I was having a great time. I, I, I looked like the inside feeling of an Oreo when I'd get hit or something. I'd just get crushed. I was just so, so big and, and so much stronger than I was. But I always liked to play, and I liked to play defense. And, and this quarterback was, had a quarterback keeper, and he was running around the end, and I was there, and I decided I was going to take him out, you know. And so I, gra- I grabbed him and grabbed a hold of his legs, and the Lord helped me. I tied his legs together, and I mean, he went down. It's just like if you grab his legs, he just went down face first, and bam, he bounced off the ground. Of course, I bounced on the ground too. And I'm laying there, and he jumps up, and he jumps over me, he says, you're dead meat. You're dead meat. You just wait. You're going to get it. You're dead meaty meat. Get up from there. And I thought, oh, no. And everybody, all these guys start closing in because what's going to happen? There's going to be a rumble. They thought I wasn't going to rumble, but they're going to rumble. I might rumble around. But uh, he was standing right over me. And then all of a sudden, this friend of mine, he steps up and he walks up and he looks at the situation and he says, do we have a problem here? And all these other guys looked at him and looked at me. And the big guy, he got up and he, walked, he said, no, nothing at all. And they walked off. Nothing changed other than the fact, I mean, I felt like, you know, when I got up, I was just sort of, you know, how you sort of, I don't know how to do it, you know, strutted. I just thought, you know, I you know, showed him, didn't I, you know, like that. But, but nothing had really changed. The, only, the, the guy was still 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, something like that, 230 pounds. He's a big guy. Nothing changed at all. The only thing that changed was I realized that the power that was on my side was stronger than the power that was on his side. And that's the way we are. And that's, that, that's what we need to do. Philip, he didn't recognize. He, he hadn't had it. He didn't realize we have Jesus here. Jesus has the power that he can take care of these needs that we have. Anything impossible in our life, he can take the impossible and make them possible. Greater are the powers on our side than the powers that are against us. If you get in a dark place, if you get in a situation, if you get in a, you just feel you don't know where you're at and you need help and you cry out to God and stuff, Realize that the power's on that your side, the power that is on your side, is greater than all this darkness that's trying to come in over you. First John four four in the New King James Version says, "You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world." You see, our perception of the situation will determine our response, and our response will determine what? Our outcome of our impossibility, of our situation, of uh, of whatever our circumstance that is up against us. You know, that that is what we see here. Probably you've never realized it, but, but we see this here with Philip. Philip, I don't know if you read here and you've noticed it, but, but when they brought back the five loaves and the two fish, Philip's not the one that brought them back. Philip's not the one that, that gave them to him. Who gave them to him? Andrew. Andrew was the one that brought them back. Both were facing the same impossibility. Both of them were. Philip, it's impossible. Andrew, well, it might be impossible, but he's here. Let's just bring what we have and give it to him and see what he can do with it. David, another story in the Bible, 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, the Israelites are facing a giant. They're facing an impossibility. 
All of them, they run from him. Even Saul, a mighty warrior, it looked impossible to him. In 1 Samuel 17, starting with verse 22, it says, And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted the brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Then we read on down in verse 34, it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion and a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from, the, from its mouth. And when I rose against, when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God, moreover David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine." Saul and his army, what did they see? They saw the impossibility. They saw it it was impossible, and they were overcome by fear. David, he walks up, and what does he do? He sees that God is bigger than his impossibility. Look it up, 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 6, and it gives some scripture there of his response. No matter how big your impossibility, we need to hear this right here because there's a lot of us that have, there's a lot of us that, that, that are facing, seems like, impossibilities in our life right now, and there are those that in the future you're going to be facing some impossibilities, and you need to hear this. No matter how big your impossibilities may be, if you have the God of impossibility on your side, you don't have any possible, anything impossible. I... Uh, was thinking, I heard a while back, and I had to really think through the process of, of the story, but there in heaven, Peter once used the word impossible in heaven. The angels started thinking about this word that he used, and you could hear them talking together. You could hear them talking, and they were discussing, and finally one of them said, I don't know. I don't know what that word is. Because why? The word impossible is not in heaven. It's no need for it to be used in heaven. So they don't have that word. So they walk over to to ask the Father. Because one of them said, our Father knows everything. Father knows best, you know. Our Father knows everything. And so they walked over to, to, to the Lord, to God. And they said, the word impossible, what does it mean? And the Lord said, oh, that's a word that humans use on earth when they're not trusting me, but trusting in themselves. Hmm. Interesting. That's a word humans use on earth when they are not trusting me but trusting in themselves. We don't need to look at the natural when we face impossibilities. If you're going to try to do it yourself, forget it. We need to look at what? The supernatural. The supernatural. Because we serve a God that is supernatural God. In verse 8, we read on, it says, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Okay, this is where Andrew recognizes, okay? This is where Andrew brings uh, the ingredients to Jesus. He brings the five loaves and the two fish. And still yet, obviously, 
A- Andrew brought it anyway, but, but he brought it because he knew it was going to be given to God, and God could do the impossible. Evidently, he had, he had understood that, and he knew. Andrew brought it. And there's a second principle here that, that I want to stress to you, and this might be maybe the most important one for all of us right here. It's bring what you have and do the best you can. Bring what you have and do the best you can. So many times we get discouraged because we don't feel like that we have, we, well, we feel like we're inadequate for God to move on our behalf. You ever feel that way? You feel like, I- I'm not even worthy for God to, to do this. And, you know, we think maybe if, if I just had a little bit more faith, maybe just I'd had a little bit, or, or maybe if I was just a, a, a little bit more holy, God would do this for me. You know, God didn't ask us, He didn't ask them, and He didn't ask, he didn't ask us to bring what we don't have. He didn't ask us that. He asked us to bring what we have. Through the Bible, we see this principle. And uh, we see, for example, Moses. Remember Moses when God had called him to deliver the Israelites from captivity? And uh, God is talking to him. What is Moses, what's his response? He has a panic attack, doesn't he? I, I can't do that. I, I, I just can't. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I can't even talk. So one of the things he asked God is what? He says, God, he says, for me to go before the Israelites, they're not going to believe me. I, I, I need something. I, 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 need a, I, I need maybe a miracle. I need something to prove to them. And what does God ask him? He says, what do you have in your hand? What did he say? A stick, a staff. That's good enough. I can hear. I can just think. That's good enough. Bring that along. That'll work. Here's the point. If we are honest, really, God doesn't need anything. He doesn't. He 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 is God. But sometimes there's little things like that that we need. The only reason that that. Uh, He asked us to come along is he wants to give us the opportunity to participate in a miracle that will affect our life. He wants us to be a participant. You see, God has done some of his most, I mean, you read in the Bible, think about some of the people that God used. Some of the most inadequate, some of the most unqualified. Who would ever pick fishermen to spread the gospel, to be the 12 disciples? Who would ever think? Some of these men, a Peter, a Paul, think of where they've been, what they've been doing, what kind of life they led, the unqualified. As a matter of fact, those who who are even in extremely hard places, are big fights. You know, the, the devil will fight what God is in. Have you figured that out yet? He will fight. When you try to do something for God, he's going to fight it. The devil is. And that just should verify that God is working. Uh, So anytime you're facing, realize that with God as your company, God being with you, you ought to be able to overcome and do the impossible. Throughout the Bible, like we said, uh, a lot of men looked at the natural and didn't look at the impossible, didn't look at God when they were doing things. They didn't, these men, they didn't have what it took. But what God did, he took their inadequacy, just what they had, the gifts they had. They might have had had the gifts, gifts to do things. That's just just like for Paul. Paul's a good example. We think of Paul, we think, man, he was a, a fireball, he was this and he was that and stuff. He, he's a man that started churches all over the world, a missionary. He was a man who, who preached the gospel 
Uh, he preached the gospel in places that had never been preached before, in places it had never been heard before. Writing half the New Testament, half of it. Do you know that in the Bible it actually records that Paul was a horrible speaker? It does. 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. It says, For some say Paul's letters are demanding and forceful, but in person he is weak and his speeches are worthless. Really? Really? You read in, in Acts. Did you know as far as I know, Maybe y'all might think different, but as far as I know, Paul's the only one that has ever killed anyone preaching with his preaching. He did. Let me read to you. Acts 29, 29. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting in the window sill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. You think maybe his pre Paul's preaching was so bad that he became sleepy? Anybody? I, I know why the lights are down, so I can't see y'all are sleeping. Is what it is. Be easier for y'all to sleep. No, just kidding. If you read on, Eutychus does fall, like we said. He dies. But one thing about it, God comes and God brings puts life back into him through Paul he uses Paul you see he, he, he took he, he took what Paul had and what he had he put them together and was able to work through Paul Paul's natural God's supernatural Paul uh, in 2nd Corinthians uh, the 12th chapter here he voices uh, his understanding of this and he tries to explain what we're talking about here, uh, you know, a lot of times we uh, we uh, are here. He's talking about where this thorn in the flesh and uh, the opposition, this, the, what's up against him, and where his battles are, his impossibility that he's facing. He says each time he said, "My grace is all you need." See, so he realizes. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. He's saying, I, I'm, I'm at a place where I realize, and, I, and I'm, I'm thankful for my weakness because I realize when I am weak, He is strong. This is when I come to a place where I can't do anything. My God rises up. And he's the one that takes control, and we see the power of God work. Whatever situation it might be, whether what I have is a little or what I have is a lot. In 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, let me skip down. You know, uh, I was thinking about this. We don't have to have a, a lot of faith, do we? I think I read in the Bible where it says, just a faith of a grain of mustard seed can do some mighty things. Just a, a little bit of faith. And that's all God has. He wants us to bring what we have, whether it be small or, lo or, or large, and use it. You say, Pastor Doyce, uh, I don't deserve a miracle of God. Maybe that's where you're at. I don't deserve this miracle of God. You know what? I don't deserve anything I have. You don't really deserve anything you have. I, I, I don't deserve living in America. I don't. Why, why, why were we born living in a land of the free? Why? I don't deserve uh, the Christian parents that I had. That would take me to church. There's people that don't ha haven't had Christian parents. Why me? I don't deserve that. My wife. Why do I have the wife I have? A Christian. Uh, uh, help me. The children I have. The home I have. I, I, I've never done. I've often wondered why in the world God did you ever do that? I can remember lying in bed at night and praying and say, God, 
all I want you to do is just use me. I don't care. I don't want anything. Just, I just want to be able to make it. Well, he's answered that prayer. I've, I've, I've never went without food. I can't say I've ever starved. Maybe some of us, like me, would help if we would starve a little bit. To be here this morning, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve being your pastor. I don't deserve it. My salvation, I don't deserve my salvation. I don't. But you know what God says? He says, just come as you are. Just come as you are. Just bring what you have. And just do your best. Just do your best. Which leads me to my last thought here. John 10, 6, 10, and 11. It says, tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slope. The men alone with about five, the men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. In the King James, in several versions, it says to the disciples, not the overall, just he distributed them to the people, but he distributed them to the disciples to distribute to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. The last principle is, that I want to share with you this, is, is choose to obey. Choose to obey. Choose to obey. You know, we be- obey a lot of things in life. You ever, I don't know if you ever thought about that. I started jotting some things down this week, and I thought, wow, there's times in my life, that's what I've obeyed. I've obeyed this, and I've obeyed that. For instance, you know, uh, sometimes what we do is we obey our emotions. Did you ever think about that? We get in a place, and we worry, and we fret, and we obey what those emotions. We, we obey our attitudes with our responses. Sometimes our attitude, we, we obey those. We obey our pride. We obey people. What we do is we obey the natural. We're, we live in a natural world. We live in a world of the flesh and bone. And we obey the, that before we obey the supernatural. He had the, they, he told them to have the crowd sit down. As I was visualizing this, I was thinking even this morning that this is probably the way Scott feels when he tries, okay, we're going to have prayer. We're going to start service. We're going to, you know, and people are talking and people are walking around and stuff. And, and the disciples, see, the, the disciples at first, they didn't know really what was going on here because what did they, they brought up five loaves and two fish, hadn't they? Five loaves and two fish. And he's getting ready to have them sit down. And the disciples are going to have, put them in rows of fifties and hundreds. And then what are you going to do, Jesus? What's going to happen here? And they start doing that. Now think about the people who had been there all day and they were hungry. And they're trying to get them to sit down, trying to organize them together. You see, the disciples were up against some tough stuff. Then Jesus goes in, and, and he, he, he reaches in, and he takes these five loaves, and he takes these baskets, and he breaks the bread. Now, if there were that many people, I don't think he broke off every piece. Probably what took place was when he gave it to the disciples after he broke the bread and put it in the back. Can you see? I, th- this bread was not a, a loaf like this. From my reading and my understanding, what we're talking about is a bagel. A bagel, five bagels. The fish were not fish like Don has hanging on his wall. But you know what they were like? It says in commentaries that they were probably about the size of a large sardine. Hmm. Can you imagine how the disciples must have felt when Jesus breaks the bread and he puts some in each basket? And then he takes the sardines and he puts them in each bad boy. It must have been a, it had to have been a fat sardine, wouldn't it? And spread it out. And then he hands them the basket and he says, okay, feed them. The first person reaches in and they take that little piece of bread 
and they break off a little piece to eat and then the disciples says, well, go ahead and get a little more. And they break off a little more. And they look down there, and all of a sudden, there's more. The disciples realize that every time that they break some off, the same amount's still there. And so what they start doing, I, and, and I'm using my imagination here, is, is they reach down there, and as they're trying to pass it out, they're breaking it off because they don't want the people to see inside that there's just little bitty pieces in there. And they're breaking it off, they're breaking it off, they're breaking it off, and they're passing it out. And it says that when they got through, there was more than enough. More than enough. You know, that reminds me of the story in 1 Kings where there was a woman that, that didn't have, she had a pot of oil and a little, little meal, a little flour. And, and she was going to eat that and her and her son were going to die. That's where it was at. And the prophet came and he asked for, for something and she fixed him something. And the prophet told her, you will be supported. God, what he did, he supplied the need. And every time they pour that oil, he said, as many pots as you bring, I'll fill that up. And she started bringing the pots and started filling it up. And you know, that, that's exactly what happened. When they got through, what happens? The, the disciples ha had how many baskets full? Twelve basketfuls. You see, God doesn't just overcome the impossible. He, he gives us more. I was thinking about... Uh, Can't think of his name now. Don't blank. Uh, Job, duh. Job. He he loses all his family. What happens? He he gets more than enough. That's the way God works. It is the impossible. Job. I'm sure he felt like he was the impossible. He had lost everything he has. He, 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 was, he was just ready. His wife told him, curse God and die. I mean, what else? Nothing left, all gone. But you know what? God come back around, and God did the impossible. And God brought blessing and help. You may seem like you're in the, in the impossible place. You know, I was thinking about those 12 baskets. Maybe those 12 baskets were for each one of the disciples. I've heard that before. And maybe it was to help them realize and, and, and help it to increase their faith in that God can do the impossible. And they brought this home. And their family said, well, Peter or Paul or whatever, said, who, Andrew, where'd you get that? You'll never believe what happened. You'll never believe what happened. God always provides more than enough. Or, or, or maybe it was for the young boy. You see, you bring what you have, you do, you, you, you do your best, you do what you can, and he'll take care of the rest. That's where God is. So if you're in a place and you're facing impossibilities, do what you know to do. Bring what you have before God and say, God, here it is. This is all I know to do. I know there was a time in my life that I was in a very dark place. And I told God, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what to do, God. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know. All I know is you, God. You know what? God did it. He did it. That's when he come on the scene. When I had exhausted all, if I'd given him all I had, I'd used all I had. I'd brought before him all that I had, and he took care of the rest. You see, God acts for steps of obedience in our life. The little boy, he was obedient. He gave up. Andrew was obedient. He brought. The disciples were obedient. They, they could have got scared and said, hey, I'll tell you what, Jesus, maybe you ought to pass this meal out. But they didn't. They did that. It, it looked impossible. But they went ahead anyway. They got, had what they had, they used. Obedience plays a huge part in us receiving our miracle. If you read in the Bible, the majority of the time, people who receive miracles are asked to do something. Stretch out your hand. 
take up your bed and walk. And that obedience, what if he hadn't stretched out his hand? What if he hadn't took up his bed? What if he hadn't have walked? He probably would have never got up. He probably would have never been able to walk. He probably never would have been able to stretch out his hand, you see. That obedience plays a major part in us receiving our miracle. And the enemy wants us to think through the natural, through our, 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 see through our earthly eyes, and not see the supernatural at God who he really is. And he's a God that can take away the impossible and make it possible. How many times have we missed our miracle because we looked at the impossible and it kept us from obeying? How many times have we looked at the impossible and it kept us from obeying? You know, it's amazing what God can do with the impossible. Did you know that? Stand up if you would. I want you to take your right hand I want you to put it on your heart. And I want you to repeat after me. God, oh, we can do better than that. God, I'm impossible. I want to tell you this morning. And I want, no, you don't have to beat that. I appreciate your obedience. God's going to bless you because this morning, I want to tell you, if you will just look beyond the natural. If you will use what you have and do the best you can with the ability or whatever it is you have. If you'll choose to obey what you know to do. He'll take the impossible you and use you. He'll do the impossible through you, like he did Paul, if you'll just do that. Like he did the disciples, like he did this little boy. There's no age limit on it. We serve a God of the impossible. If we can just get that, we'll have victory in our life every day because we can throw that at the devil and we can rub it in his face and we can laugh at him. Because we serve a God who is, and I text someone this morning a word of encouragement and told this individual, God is able. And he is able. He is able. We serve an awesome God. As I come into the gates of praise. You need to pray. To your You're facing impossibilities. You come. Here we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance. I see the fullness of your grace. And I can only bow down and say, God wants you to eat. You come down. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. 
I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace, and I can only bow down and say, you are awesome in this place, mighty Say 
Jesus. 